Lord, cleanse us. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For the blood of Jesus is powerful to set us free. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one who guides my heart. Repeat that one more time. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. to uh, prepare ourselves for the sermon by grabbing our Bibles or our digital Bibles and waving it in the air and let's do this. This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. I pray that everyone's comfortable in this nicely uh, 
condition, air conditioned room. <laughs> now that we're comfortable and we recognize the blessing of the Lord giving us a comfortable place to sit, to gather, to worship, to honor Him, and now to receive from Him as He sowed uh, His Word into our hearts. Lord, we thank you for this series we're about to embark. How do I know? We have many questions. Our family, our friends have many questions. And Lord, we just want to be open, Lord, to the leading of your Holy Spirit now and forevermore, Lord, so that we can be witnesses of you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to this world. We thank you, Lord, for wisdom that only you can give. We thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. How do I know is our new teaching series. It's not how will I know, how do I know? How do I know? And um, our first teaching is how do I know there is a God? And um, I started out with one teaching and this is kind of like, um, in a way, inspired by a teaching uh, by Pastor Robert Morris from a Gateway Church, I believe in Dallas. Um, but as I was reviewing this, I realized, oh, I'm going to need two part to cover this. Um, and so you'll see why. Uh, you'll see why in a moment. So a friend or family members may come up to you especially a non-believing friend or family, may come up to you one day, or may, they may have already come up to you and ask this very question, how do I know there is a God? Or in fact, how do you know if there is a God, right? And so it's easy to go to Scripture, and I'll show you three Scripture, but I will not elaborate on them because I want to save them for next week. But just so you can take a quick glance these three scripture that I have uh, gathered here, and thank God for them. The first one is he from Hebrews 11, verse 6. Um, let's read together, okay? Hebrew 11, verse 6, let us read. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So the important element here is your faith. To please God, you need to have faith. And faith is basically walking, believing in something that you don't see. You have the assurance that there are evidence for it already. So therefore, you walk by faith, not by sight. However, there are times where we would have to ask the question ourselves, do we have the faith to please God, right? And that would be between you and the Lord. And as we walk with Him in our lives, we pray, we believe for things, and when he answers, respond. Or when he doesn't answer or respond, and we give thanks because we know he will, then what you're doing is you're acknowledging him in your life. The more you're acknowledging him, acknowledging God, the more you give thanks, the more faith is built in your life. And we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, right? So the more you read the Bible, the more you hear the teaching of the Word, your faith, your faith is built up, okay? So that's how we please God. In Psalm 19, verse 1 to 3, it says, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display His craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Amazing. So first, we looked at Hebrews, talk about our faith. And now the Lord's saying, look at 
the heavens. Look at the skies. They don't even need to say anything about me. But their very presence in and around your world should tell you that I exist. In fact, it says day after day and night after night. Wouldn't you say that is pretty much 24 hours a day? Day after day, night after night? If only we would stop and look up and look around. Sometimes we are so focused on what is in front of us on the ground and what's kind of close by, but we forget about the massive universe that he created. It's there. As you look upon it, you realize, wow, what a wonderful heaven that God has created. Next week, we'll go into more detail the facts that are based, that support this, this scripture. And we will see about our earth, our atmosphere. And the third verse here is Psalm 139, verse 13 to 14. Let's read together. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. I mean, <laughs> you look at our body. Our bodies are so complex. The brain, these eyes, the heart. It is so complex. Even science, medical science, are still studying these organs. They are so complex. We build computers, cannot match the complexity. You know, you, that's why you see computers by itself without man is nothing, right? So who built the computers? Man. By the brain power that the Lord has given him. So it's amazing to look at these three scripture, and right there you can realize that, man, there is a God. However, when an atheist or a critic of the Christian faith asks you the very same question, how do you know there is a God? Well, what happens then is they put the burden of proof on you as believers. They say, you prove to me, right? You prove to me that God exists. Before we dive into how we should respond scientifically, because that's what they want. If you use scripture to share with them, they have no faith. There are no reference point for them. They want you to, quote, unquote, intellectually explain to them, prove to them that God exists. And so they want you to use scientific method because the burden of pro uh, proof is on you to show them that God exists. And that's what I want to focus on this teaching today is the scientific method in responding to that question. And before we get to responding to that question, you must realize that just because someone asks you the question, how do I know there is a God, does not mean that they're mean spirit, they want to pick a fight. It's just a friendly question, a question maybe they're yearning to know. So you have to prepare yourself and in your response, it should be something like responding your opinion to a friend. You should not feel threatened, nor they should feel threatened. You have to understand the context when you sit down with your friend or your family or even a critic or an atheist. Hey, in my opinion, 
This is how I believe God exists. If you pray and prepare your hearts accordingly, the Holy Spirit will work with you to give you the response that they desperately need. And prayerfully, that will turn their heart towards God. So don't make it into some kind of confrontational debate because we want to sow the seeds, the Word of God into people's lives. You might not convince them in that first discussion when you share your opinion, but you would have effectively sow a seed into their hearts. And when the time comes, that seed will grow, will grow and bear fruit. And we pray that in that bearing of the fruit, they will turn their hearts to the Lord. So remember, it's a conversation between friends. Kind of like um, if you have gone to school or to work and then we had the COVID, the pandemic shut down, right? And you haven't seen your friends for a while. And then finally you met them, met your friends again, and, and maybe in the cafeteria at school or in a cafeteria at work. And you sit across from them and then you kind of share, oh, yeah, during the pandemic, you know, I, I, we went through a lot as a family and, and, and how we overcame it was this and that, you know. Um, and now we're back, you know, my family's healthy and all that, right? Your friend would say, wow, that's, that's awesome. I'm so glad things turned out great for you, right? And that's the conversation we should have and the heart behind it when we answer, how do I know there is a God? Okay, so understand your heart when you share your opinion that they would not be offended by your opinion, nor you would be offended by their opinion if they're diff different, okay? So the respect for each other, sharing one another opinion. So I have three points today. The first point is there is a correct worldview. Okay, the first point, there is a correct worldview. A worldview is how you see the world, how you see life. Your worldview should help you with some questions that help you through your life. It brings comfort to you as a person, to your thinking process, and to your soul. So a correct worldview must have four issues, must address, sorry, must address four issues. First, origin. Second, meaning. Third, morality. Fourth, destiny. Let me kind of elaborate a little bit. So first, origin being able to answer, how did, I, how did I get here? How did I get here? That's origin. Meaning is, why am I here? Morality, how do I define good and evil? And fourth, destiny, what happens to me after death? So a worldview, a correct worldview must address those four issues. And I'm here to tell you today that there's only one worldview that answers these issues. That is Christianity. And before you say, oh, wait, 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 there's something else. And I hear about this and that. Well, give me an opportunity to share with you. Other worldview includes evolution, right? We know that. We understand that. That's being taught through the school. And evolution, even though it's been around what, uh, about 161 years? You know, it started in 1859. And it's still a theory of evolution. But because it's shared so much, it's taught so much, it's put in front of students to the point where that word theory kind of like faded out. And people grab onto it as, as proven. 161 years, 
It's still a theory of evolution. So when Charles Darwin, many of us have studied here, right? He wrote, what's the book called? Anyone? Origin of Species, right? Origin of Species. And um, he actually used two chapters in there to doubt his theory. The first one was the complexity of the eye. He couldn't explain how can something form into something so complex like the eye, right? And also, another chapter in that book, he made a statement challenging the science community to come up with a solid scientific evidence to prove this theory and within a reasonable time frame. And if not, then it would disprove the theory. And of course, you know, I mentioned to you already, it has been 161 years. The evidence obviously is clear, right? Within one species, we do change. But there is no evidence where one species has mutated into another. So for example, if I'm born as an infant, as a baby, eventually I will change into an adult, you know, from maybe 20 inches to six foot two, <laughs> you know? There is a change. But I don't change into another species. So evolution also says we are time, matter, and chance, kind of like the term metaphysical. We are time, matter, and chance. The problem with this is if we are metaphysical, then why do we react when people die? Why do we feel sorrowful when someone close to us pass away? Or even someone who we don't know. Maybe you read the news and all of a sudden, someone's death really touches you. If you are just matter, why do you have that feeling? Because we have a soul, right? We have a soul. The third, the third item from, uh, from the list of issues I read before is morality. How do I define good and evil? Well, a lot of people say nowadays it's subjective. You know, what I deem good is good to me. What I deem evil is evil to me. And for you, it may be different. Well, if we believe that, then uh, we bought into many, many, even Christian have bought into a subjective morality. So let me give this an illustration and ask you this question about subjective morality. Do you lock your door at night? Do you lock your window at night? And why do you do that? Is it because of the fear of a subjective morality where someone may believe that it's not wrong to go into someone's house, tie them up, steal their belonging, maybe harm them. Because of that fear of subjective morality that we close and lock our door, right? So that was my first point in that there is a correct worldview, and that's Christianity. My second point is there is no atheist. There is no atheist. Atheism says there is no God. There is no God. It is scientifically impossible to be an atheist. Okay, let's take a science approach to proving this. The word science is knowledge about the study of the natural world based on facts learned through experiment and observation. Right? Would you agree? That's science. And it's based on experiment and observation. The word atheist, a theos, theos means God, a is 
a prefix antonym. So no God, no God, right? No as in N-O, God. Scientifically, you can't definitively say there is no God, right? And in order for you to say something doesn't exist, you need to have all knowledge. Let me say that again. In order for you to say something doesn't exist, you have to have all knowledge. Let me give you an example, and maybe this will help. If you were to say to me, there is no city called Westminster, California, right? If you say to me, you live somewhere across the world, and you call me and say, Pastor Kian or Kian, there is no city called Westminster, California, right? And I would respond and say, well, you show me your study. You show me your observation, your data, how you conclude that there is no Westminster, California. Well, how would you do that? Well, in order to show that there is, a, oh, there is no Westminster, California, you would have to have all knowledge. That means you have to have visited all the city in California to come up with the conclusion, say, hey, I visited all the city in California. I found no Westminster. That's how I would expect you to give me a scientific answer. That's what I mean by you can't say that something does not exist without all knowledge. Right? So, but if I say to you, I know Westminster, California exists because I drive by Westminster City Hall every day, every week, coming to church and coming home from church. There is a city hall, a civic center of Westminster, so therefore there is a Westminster city. It is because I experienced that. I seen that. That's my data, right? So it's easy for me to say, but for you to say that it does not exist, you need to have all knowledge. That means you have to have visited all the city in this state to be able to tell me that it doesn't exist. So, in the same way, you can't say that there is no God without all knowledge. In the same way, you can't say there is no God without all knowledge. All right, so let's talk about knowledge and wisdom and the smartest people, right? in the world. So how much of all knowledge does the smartest person in the world has? Who can answer that in percentage? If you imagine all knowledge meaning that all history from all civilization from the beginning of time to the present, maybe you talk about math, you know basic arithmetic, Algebra, geometry, trigonometry, right? Pre-calculus, calculus, differential equation. There are uh, number theory, set theory, game theory, topology, uh, combinatorics. You would have an understanding of all that. And what about language? Currently, right, there are over 7,000 languages. You would have to know all that. So you kind of get my point about all knowledge to be able to prove that God does not exist because you have to search everywhere until you can say to me that God doesn't exist because I looked everywhere, the wisdom of man, everywhere on earth, all culture. So the smartest person in the world right now is Christopher Langan, he's 70 years old. His IQ score is between 195 and 210. And guess what his, his 
occupation is. He's a horse rancher. <laughs> he said, you can prove the existing of, existence of God, the soul, and the afterlife using mathematics. He said that, okay? So let's just say the smartest person in the world possesses less than 1% of all knowledge. That's fair, right? Let's say less than 1% the smartest person in the world. The problem with that is, is that enough? What about the 99%? So is it possible that the 99% of the, of the all knowledge that the smartest person did not possess prove that there is God? So therefore, that person cannot say with less than 1% that there is no God. All right? You follow me? So with the smartest person in the world, he doesn't have 99%. He just have the less than 1% of all knowledge. And yet, if he say that there is no God, that means that there's still 99% possibility that there is God. So he can't really say that percentage-wise. So you can say, I don't know there is a God, but you can't say definitively there is no God. Let me repeat that. You can say that I don't know there is a God, but you can't say definitively there is no God. So if you were to say that I don't know there is a God, then what do you call? You're an agnostic, right? An agnostic. So you're not an atheist. You're an agnostic. So that's why this point deals with there is no atheist. Because you can't say there is no God with the less than 1% of all knowledge. You can't say that unless you have the 99%, but you don't. Psalm 14, one says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, right? We hear that scripture. So it's foolish to say there is no God. It's foolish. I only have the smartest man, less than 1%. I can't say that. My third point is there is a God. So based on there is no atheist argument. I just gave you point number two. You could turn it around and put the burden of proof on me and say, okay, less than 1% of all knowledge. Can you tell me that God exists? Can you tell me that God exists? I mean, I admit, I don't even have 0.0000001% of all knowledge. <laughs> I'm more like closer, you know, the, the similar to or around approximate sign, wiggle sign to 0%, <laughs> right? But I can tell you that I've talked to God. I can tell you that he has shared something to me and that he's my friend. I don't need the burden of proof because I have the experience. So when you're talking with a critic, someone who wants to see if you can come up with evidence, and when your evidence, your data, doesn't satisfy him or her, they feel like they're justified to reject God. You must understand where they're coming from. They're looking for data. Well, the data is you can't say that there is no God. But you, because of your personal experience with God, you have data to say that God exists. And through your life and your encounter with God and what he has done for you, you know he exists. 
So, for example, our beloved Pastor Lee is sitting in front of us today. And um, let's use the same example as Westminster, California, right? But this time we'll use Pastor Lee instead of a place, we have a person, okay? You can tell me, past, or you can say, Lee Ho does not exist, right? And I would turn to you and say, you prove it. Show me all the data. You have searched this world of everybody who has his character, his demeanor, his physical appearance. And by the way, he has his name, Lee Ho. If you search this world and you couldn't find anybody, then, okay, I believe you. But I can tell you, Lee Ho exists because I know him. I talk to him. I see him every week. He is my friend. In fact, he's my brother in law. And in the same way, you can say God exists because you've talked to him. He talks to you, he's your friend. So that is important. Your personal experience is very important. It's something that we live to make sure we never lose that. When we're distracted by things of the world, we no longer have that experience. And when we're confronted with questions, we can't speak up because we have no confidence in our relationship with God. It is so important. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word today. And, but more, thank you for the wisdom you've given us to, to look at a very uh, common question, a thought-provoking question, especially to those who have not experienced a relationship with you. And we hear their hearts, Lord God. There are so many people who desire to know you. Lord, help us, first of all, with our hearts, never to feel challenge, pressure, but to always have a compassion for our family, for our friends, to be patient, explaining our opinion, our belief, that we would not ever be offended because they may conclude otherwise having different opinion. And Lord, may they not be offended, but receive what we have to say for their sake, Lord God. So we thank you, Lord, for your word today. We bless you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.